right, so welcome back. We are here for another study this week. We have been studying the parables uh, during this time apart from one another. And so Travis Creasy joins us once again from Riverside. And uh, we have, obviously, Will Myhan. And this time, Will and I are six feet apart. Uh, We are in different places. And so uh, we're going to study a little bit more from the parables today. Uh, We're going to be looking at Luke chapter 12. So if you want to be turning your Bibles over to Luke chapter 12, that's what we're going to be looking at. And it starts in verse 13. And I'm just going to kind of give an intro and uh, let Will read the parable in just a second. But the parable really relates to a question that's asked by Jesus, as oftentimes many of the parables uh, are that way. Uh, in that somebody comes to Jesus and says, hey, we've got this question, and then Jesus gives them this story to illustrate it. So someone in the crowd says to him, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Um, So a lot of times we see uh, these scenarios where brothers are fighting or sisters are fighting, family members are fighting over the things that are being uh, left to them or that have been left to them. And so that's what sets up this whole story is uh, this question or this statement that's made to Jesus uh, by this individual. So keep that in the back of your mind as we begin to read. And so I'll let uh, Will pick up from there in verse 14, and then we'll get started talking about this section. All right, Luke chapter 12, we'll start in verse 14. Here's the answer that Jesus gives to the man. He says, friend, he said to him, who appointed me a judge or arbitrator over you, he, to, he then told them, watch out and be on guard against all greed because one's life is not in the abundance of his possessions. Then he told them a parable. A rich man's land was very productive. He thought to himself, what should I do since I don't have anywhere to store my crops? I will do this, he said. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones and store all my grain and my goods there. Then I'll say to myself, you have many goods stored up for many years. Take it easy, eat, drink, and enjoy yourself. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life is demanded of you, and the things that you have prepared, whose will they be? That is how it is with the one who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. All right, so as I was thinking about this passage uh, this week, I've had to go to the store a couple of times uh, because my kids eat me out of house and home, and um, there are a lot of empty shelves at the, the stores. There's A lot of people who have bought every roll of toilet paper that there is to buy, it's starting to get a little bit better on that. But the one thing I was looking for for my parents uh, were some um, alcohol wipes and some, um, uh, what do you call it, hand sanitizer, stuff like that, Lysol. None of that stuff's available. Any of the cleaning supplies that you want, they're all gone. Unless you need Windex, they have Windex. Um, But everything else... It seems as though, I mean, my guess is that everybody's stockpiling this stuff because I I have it hard to believe that all of those things will be gone unless people are getting a bunch of them. Uh, And so this story kind of came to mind because here's this guy who is sort of stockpiling his goods. He's he's getting as much gathered as he as he possibly can for whatever reason. But there's going to be a problem with that. As we know, as you get into the parable, it talks a little bit about what's going to happen to him. So Travis, tell us a little bit about uh, some of this parable and what you see in it as Jesus uh, continues this thought. Well, I think the, the idea, I think you, you're hitting on it pretty well, is the idea of consumption and versus, you know, this stockpiling and not versus really they're almost the same thing. And I think that Jesus kind of goes back to when he talks about the, you know, not serving two masters. And in the King James Version, talks about a word mammon, uh, the idea of mammon in other places as unrighteous mammon. If you, if you can't handle unrighteous mammon, King James language, then, you know, what are you going to do with your life? And so it's being consumed, right? It's being consumed with something other than God, than the righteousness of God. If you pack up to the first few verses of the chapter, it talks about being, be aware of the leaven of the Pharisees, right? You have Basically, in this life, there are two, and, and this is simplifying it, oversimplifying it. You have two beings, and in one case, a being, in one case, things that want to consume your life. And, and obviously, under the things category, there are, there's worry, 
You know, we could be consumed with worry. We could be consumed here uh, with covetousness, I think is the exact context. You know, you say, and you know, who should decide what you and your brother get? Well, number one, are you generous towards God? You know, or are you giving God what rightfully belongs to him, which is everything, or you're going to be consumed. I think the, to me, when it talks about the two masters is the, the thing that comes across is you are going to serve something, right? There are people in the world who think, oh, well, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm Mr. Macho and I don't, you know, I'm an island. I don't really serve anybody. I'm a lone wolf and I don't, I'm not influenced by anything. I remember being in the youth group, Will, and thinking, you know, my youth minister, you know, he doesn't know what he's talking about. I can watch what I want. I can do what I want. And it won't have any influence on me. What, almost 39 years old, I look back and go, man, I was an idiot, you know, because I'm easily influenced and, and it's easier to see today than it was back then, mainly because I'm willing to admit, yes, I am easily influenced and so I think what 12 the chapter and really chapter 11 and 13 after it are about is be aware of the influences of the world things can consume your thoughts and we certainly live in a day and age where Satan is enjoying the opportunity to consume our thoughts in Philippians it says let us be known by our reasonableness you know, allow us to know because we believe the Lord is at hand. Let people yeah. know us by our reasonableness. And I think, you know, and I'm one to talk chief of centers, you know, the things we post on social media, the things we post and talk about with our friends, you know, do people look at us and go, well, they seem like reasonable folks. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I couldn't help but think about what you're saying being reasonable people is the whole idea of, of hoarding toilet paper. You know, like we've talked about that before. Why toilet paper? You know, so many people, I mean, and, and the fact that we can be so easily influenced when we see other people doing it, then we go out to do it. Like, well, if they're getting all the toilet paper, then I've got to go get all the toilet paper. And everybody oh, responds to that and they all go out and buy the toilet. Then we don't have toilet paper. And had everybody went and, you know, just got a, 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 a thing of it, it wouldn't have been that big of a deal but because everybody started buying it up and that, you know, obviously I understand nobody wants to be without toilet paper, but of all the items to hoard in a s scenario that we're in toilet paper just really didn't seem like the one that made sense. Cleaning supplies, maybe, but toilet paper, not so much, but it's the fact that we get so wrapped up in what everybody else is doing. And here these guys are, are debating about, you know, share this inheritance, divide this. We need this money. We want this money. Divide this with us and tell us how to do this. And of course, Jesus jumps in and says, I'll always love his responses. Man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter over you? Like, when did that become my job? That's not what I do. And, and um, that falls under the category of things you don't want Jesus to ever be. I, you know, only God can judge me. Well, are you sure? You know, I'd much rather Ben and Will honestly, as I love y'all, I'd much rather y'all judge me because you have very little control over the final judgment. The last person I want is Jesus judging me. I'm going to fall short. We're going to get it one day, but it is the last thing that, you know, yeah. when you really think about that, like look at the, the guy he is, I mean, the perfect, the perfectness that he is. Uh, and so, yeah, that's a, that's a crazy thought, but you know, who appointed me is this over you. So Will, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, I mean, I don't know. There's just a whole lot to unpack, kind of like what I talked about last week. It seems, you know, sometimes we miss the forest for the trees, you know, and just miss the entire point that's there. I think what's interesting to me, verse, you know, 16, he says, he told them a parable, a rich man's land was very productive. I don't think, you know, growing up, you always hear the idea that it's, it's bad to be rich if you want to go to heaven, you know, and all of this idea there. And it, it doesn't seem that that's ever really spoken by Jesus. You know, now we know that the love, the influence of money and greed and all that, yes, that becomes a severe issue. But what's interesting to me is that desire and that want for more, you know, that he really sticks out. And then you go down to verse 21. That's how it is with the one who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. You know, and I've always thought about like, Ben knows this, especially like I love new technology stuff. 
you know, and a lot of people in my family know very, without a doubt, Lindsay loves going to Target as most of our wives do. You know, they, they very much enjoy it. And a lot of times they get a bad rap, you know, because they're the shoppers where I can go buy a new piece of technology and probably outdo what Lindsay spent in one trip versus, you know, a thousand trips for her. And so I've always been curious on this idea of what does it mean to be rich toward God? Because that, that seems to be the underlying thing that Jesus is trying to push here. Yeah, it, it's not bad to be wealthy. It's not bad to be rich. But how rich am I toward God? So I, I would love to hear both of y'all kind of talk to that in, in, a, in a question of what does it mean to be rich toward God? You know, when Jesus is really talking about that. Yeah, I think uh, for an answer to that, you go to 1 Timothy 6. And of course, I think Jesus sets up the parable almost with the answer, if that makes sense. Because he says, watch out, be on guard against all kinds of greed, covetousness, because a man's life does not consist of the abundance of possessions. So he gives a hint that life is more than just what you own. Life is more than your house, than your car, than your gadgets, than your computer, than, you know, all the things that you have. Life consists of so much more than that. And then over in 1 Timothy chapter 6, um, Paul is talking about godliness and contentment, beginning in verse 6. Um, he probably talks about it some before that. That's where I usually kind of pick up the passage. But godliness actually is a means of great gain when accompanied by contentment. For we brought nothing into the world, so we can't take anything out either. If we have food and covering with those, we should be content. But those who want to get rich fall into a temptation and a snare and many foolish and harmful desires, which plunge men into ruin and destruction for the love of money, not money itself. The love of money is the root of all sorts of evil. And some by longing for it have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves through with many griefs. You know, the next couple of verses he talks about, but here's what you need to pursue. So you're going to talk about being rich towards God. Here's what you pursue. Righteousness, godliness, faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of eternal life, which is uh, to which you were called and were made, have made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. And so uh, he says, the, these are the things that if you really want a life that consists of more than your possessions, then you want to take hold of these things. So instead of taking hold of the money, you know, take the money and run, it's take a hold of these spiritual things and run with them. Travis, you want to add something to that too? I think uh, just uh, with Paul, once again, you know, the, the, I've learned to be content with a lot of things. I've learned to be content without these things. And I, I guess Philippians 4. Yeah, you know, and that's where we are reasonable. Let's let it be known. Um, Philippians four there, um, but I mean, going into things, and and we, I've I've got certainly more at my house than I need for sure. But anytime you go into a purchase of, you know, thinking, you know, how can we use this uh, for the kingdom? What what you know, whether it's a house or a car or, you know, and and y'all know me I'm always posting something probably of collecting uh, athletic uh, memorabilia you know and we have an auction here at Riverside and and typically uh, if I buy something I, I you know my the back of my mind is is you know either I'm going to keep this for myself or I'm going to donate that auction one or the other and and there's been a lot of things that I've gotten and thought man I'm going to keep this for the long haul and then but it turns out hey man let's just put it in the auction I've, I've got this or that and so you know, just being willing and open to saying, how can this be used for the kingdom and being in, in a word I'm using a lot lately is available. Um, I remember being, you know, growing up and having a yard sale uh, at my mom's house. And it was always a lot easier to go get my brother's stuff and put it in the yard sale. Right. Oh, yeah. uh, you Absolutely. Know, Cause I didn't, it didn't belong to me. So, Oh yeah. You can put that toy or that picture or whatever it is. And, but then when it came to my room and cleaning it out, I was a lot more particular on what I wanted to put in the yard sale. And so I think it's that idea of covetousness. You know, I've got to have this. So it's so at the forefront of my mind, I can't think of anything else. And I think that is fueled by our fear. It's filled by, I go back to the toilet paper. I think it's fueled by fear. 
Uh, and I think that all of us in this time probably feel that to some degree, even, you know, even to a little bit of making sure that, you know, when we were talking about our families, making sure that they're taken care of, you know, I can sacrifice on my end uh, for my kids. That, that comes a lot more natural for my wife, but are we willing to do that for complete strangers? Because that's as well as Jesus knew us, that's what he did. He was willing to give up the kingdom of heaven where we all want to be to come here and, and save us. So. I thought it was really interesting, kind of what y'all are going back off of. If you look at back at First Timothy 6, but you, man of God, flee from the things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. To be rich in God doesn't cost you anything financially. You know, it, I've always thought that, you know, when you were talking to that, Ben, that it's really interesting. You look at those things that allow us to be rich in the presence of God, and it doesn't cost me anything. I mean, it may cost me some time, some effort, but as far as financials or anything like that, I don't have to be wealthy to be pleasing to God. You know, I just, right. have, you know, going back to the love, you know, and the love that I have for other people. And am I, Travis, what you're saying, am I afraid to share that and sacrifice for the people that I don't really know, you know, when it comes to it? It's not yours. You know, nothing that, it's it didn't not, start with us. So you're exactly right. It doesn't cost us anything. If anything, it's us sacrificing what he gave us. I think about it the first of the year, everybody says, well, I'm going to give more time to God. Well, whose time is it? You know, who, who, who rings the, the death nail when it comes? I mean, God is the one who, who gave and he can take it away. And you know, I, think I brought nothing into this world and therefore yeah. I, I'm not going to take anything out either. And, and Will, I think it's important too, when you said that in verse 11 and 12, you know, pursue these things, but then, you know, that's free. Uh, but then look at verse 17. I think Paul uh, takes it a little bit further with them and says, instruct those who are rich. So that goes back to the comment you made earlier. Rich is not bad. Um, in fact, the three of us, uh, I don't have a whole lot. I don't have a big house. Um, but we're richer than most people in the world because we got cars to drive and we have a house and we have shoes to wear and we have 8 billion sets of clothes to wear. It feels like at my house, you know, and that makes us rich. Um, you don't have to have a lot of money, but he says, instruct those who are rich in this present world, not to be conceited or to fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches, but to fix your hope on God who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy, not ours, it's, it's his, and he just gives it to us. Instruct them to do good, to be rich in good works, and to be generous, ready to share, storing up for themselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is life indeed, or some versions say that which, uh, life that is truly life. Mm -hmm. And so he says, look, you can, you can have this stuff, like this man in the parable, he has stuff but he's not really rich because he's not sharing it. You know, uh, here he says, instruct those who are rich to take hold of what is truly life. Well, how do you do that? Well, he, he simply says, instruct them to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share. And, and that's really what we're supposed to do with what we have. And this guy says, hey, look, I, got, I can take it easy because I've got all this stuff. And I've put it back and I've stored up. And so I can live the easy life. And instead, he probably should have said, what can I do to help people around me with this? Because, hey, you know, that's the end of the parable is this very night, your life's going to be required of you. What's going to happen with the stuff that you have when that happens? Um, obviously, it's going to go to somebody else anyway. So why not share it with somebody? Why not help the people who are in need? And I think that's probably a a pretty good lesson for us today in this day and age, uh, especially right now with so many people in need, both financially and, and in other ways. So what are we doing to help them in our richness? Something that just scattered across my brain. So bear with me, Gary. You know, what if, what if Jesus described exactly the, the these two brothers, their, uh, their dad situation, what if, what if he's like, oh, I'm telling a parable, but you know what I'm talking about. You know, it, <laughs> it, uh, he's, that would be awesome. Either way, I think it hits home. I mean, obviously someone 
has passed away and left them something. And, and he says, you know, you think they really want you bickering over it? You know, at this point, when they've come to know God and their soul has been brought, you know, you think about people who go and, and meet their maker. You know, it's all, all of, it's amazing how their priorities fall in line. And I don't want to get ahead to another parable, but you talk about the rich man and Lazarus. You know, let me go back. Send somebody back. You know, and even if somebody raised from the dead, they're not going to, they're not going to change their heart, you know. And so when we get to the kingdom, when we get to that day of judgment, our priorities will be very streamlined. And, you know, we're not going to want, I don't want my kids bickering over the small amount that they may get, you know. Uh, we want their priorities and, and, you know, maybe that's another thing. Are we living in such a way that people see us and would realize that our priority is not things of this world? Yeah. Will, you got any, uh, anything else as far as the parables concerned? I, I think it's interesting. You know, of course, there's not really, when this was originally written, there's not all these verse breaks and everything else, but you, you keep going in verse 22 and he starts talking about, you know, what is life? What is the clothing, the ravens, the flowers of the field? And then he gets down to verse 31 and he just says, but seek his kingdom and these things will be provided for you. You know, I've always thought the older I get, I guess the more that verse rings true in this idea that I'm going to do everything I can to seek the kingdom and whether or not my life here on this earth is hard or easy everything's going to end up in a very positive way because of what Jesus did for me. You know, so regardless, I've heard a lot of people say, you know, I've been blessed in following and leave, living a life for Jesus. And I also know people on the other side that have given their life to Jesus and their life has become 10 times harder than what it was. But if I seek the kingdom, everything's going to work out in the end. You know, and you, Travis, yeah. you mentioned youth ministry. That's the thing of, you know, we try and teach the kids life's not always going to be easy. It's not always going to be great, but if I seek first, then everything's going to be taken care of. And I think that's a point that maybe Jesus is trying to iterate, you know, even with this man that regardless, if you will just put me first and everything else behind that, things are going to work out. Whether in this life we know, we don't know, but we know for sure in eternity. Well, and, and you, you started that passage and he says, you know, don't worry. And a lot of people take that as well, we can't worry or we're sinning. You know, we're sinning by being anxious or being concerned about something. And yet Jesus was in the garden crying uh, or, or sweating drops of blood, basically. So if you really think about it, Jesus was worrying about what the cross was going to be like. But in the context of worry, he's saying, instead of worrying about it, know that God's going to take care of you. Now, it, are we going to have con some concerns sometimes? Yeah. Are we going to be worried sometimes? Yeah. But the understanding is that when we do that, what did Jesus do in that scenario? It says in first Peter, he kept entrusting himself to the one who judges righteously. He kept trusting that God was going to get him through it. Did it, did it bother him that he had to go to the cross? Yes. That's why he prayed about it in the garden. But yet when he had to do it, he went ahead and faced it. And so sometimes when we look at life, there's things we don't know. I don't know what I'm going to, you know, eat. you know, there may be times when people don't know what they're going to eat. Uh, they don't know how they're going to eat, but God's going to take care of it. There, there's, there's a way and, and, and somehow some way he's going to take care of us. There may be a scenario with health or whatever. And even like you said, it may not work out to our favor in this life, but as long as we're seeking him first and his righteousness, it's going to work out at some point in some way, even if it means we're running into the arms of our loving Savior. So then he says in verse 32, so don't be afraid, little flock. I love that. I love just the, the way he says, my little flock. You know, don't, don't be afraid, for your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions, give to the poor, provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out, and treasure in heaven that will not be exhausted where no thief comes near it and no moth destroys it for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So he's saying this to his disciples after he answers these brothers, brothers, Hey, we, you know, make my brother share with me. Am I your arbiter? Don't you know that life consists of more than stuff? Let me tell you about this story who of a man who had all this stuff and then his soul was required of him 
and he didn't store up towards God. So let me tell you how to store up towards God because you uh, are people that the Father has given the kingdom to. And wherever your treasury is, there's your heart going to be. So don't store it up here on this earth. Store it up in a place that moth, nor rust, nor thieves, nor anybody else can get a hold of because that's the kind of true treasure that God wants us to have. And so I think it weaves beautifully together as, as Jesus is teaching this to his disciples. And, you know, then it kind of goes into some of the other parables or thoughts that we've had about being ready. Just be ready for that time. So don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth, but store up for your treasures in heaven and be ready for the time that he's going to call you back. Travis, you got some other thoughts or will about that? I like in my mind when I read that and he's talking to these guys, it's almost like he turns to camera number two and goes, <laughs> and for you guys, that's yeah. what, this is what this means, you know? And I think that, you know, Paul makes that, that deliation too in, in some of his letters where he's like, now, now this is not going to make sense to the world. Okay. You can't judge the world by Christian standards because they just don't know. But to you guys, you know how this is supposed to look. And I think that, that interesting thing there that Will mentioned about, you know, seek the kingdom first and all these things will be added to you. And all these things, the definition of that changes as we're sanctified and molded into the image of Christ. You know, as I said, you know, as a teenager, I wanted different things. You know, I can remember praying, Lord, let me live long enough to be married. You know, let me, let me live long enough to be in that place. And he blessed me with that. And that was wonderful. You know, at 39, it's different. If I get to live another 10 years, I'm sure at 49, that'll be different. And, and so the sanctification process changes to where it's not really what I want, but my wants, my needs, and, and even my wants turn to be more in line with his will, you know, and that doesn't mean it's easy, but the priorities change. You know, when I was going through chemotherapy, my priority was different. You know, it's different. You're, you're fighting every single day to live another day. And then the problem is, is you get to the point where you come off of that stuff and then you want to slide back into, you know, the, the priorities that you had and you don't want to waste all that you've learned. And so that's the challenge. And that's the beauty of getting together with you guys and getting together with church and, and camp and things like that, that you are constantly challenged and being sanctified and molded into that engine. Your will, wants, and needs all begin to transform by the renewing of your mind you will <laughs> will you got thoughts no nah, man i'm just trying i'm trying to keep my mind in line with the right treasure you know yeah and trying to move forward with that because it, it's a daily i mean it's a daily struggle you know and there's there's opportunities all around us but it's you know what do i treasure myself or you know the people around me so and I think a, a cool place to end this, of course, all this stuff Jesus said is amazing. But, you know, going back to James chapter four and James four, you know, come now, you who say today or tomorrow, we'll spend such and such a city and spend a year there and engage in business and make a profit. Yet you do not know what your life will be like. You're just a vapor that appears for a little while and vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and also do this or that. But as it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. And then he, he sums that up. And I think we all kind of understand what that passage means and what it says. We, we don't have control. God's got control. Um, somebody reminded, uh, said, some, I don't remember where I read this at again, but the whole idea of I don't know who holds uh, tomorrow or I don't know what tomorrow holds, but I know who holds tomorrow. And so understanding that, look, I, I can't control what I'm going to do. How many of us had plans that got, blown up like we talked about with with Blake that we couldn't do um, because of of this coronavirus and you know uh, today had several different things that have been canceled even today for further into the uh, the summertime we don't know what our lives are going to be and yet we make all these plans and he says but therefore to the one who knows the right things do and doesn't do it let's just you know today focus on the right thing um, I, I, I've been saying this long before Frozen 2, but some of you have probably seen Frozen 2 recently. And uh, I think one of the, the lines in it was do the next right thing. 
-hmm. And uh, there's actually, that's a, a statement used in AA and in, um, in, in a lot of different alcohol treatment and, and drug treatment programs is just do the next right thing. And so right now we're in a scenario where we're just kind of living day to day. We don't know what our job's going to be like. We don't know what, you know, family life's going to look like. We don't know what school's going to look like, but the best advice maybe that God has ever given is just do the right thing, you know, do the next right thing. So with this guy, instead of storing up all this treasure, just do the next right thing and take care of the people around you instead of storing up and, and taking care of yourself. What are some ways I can take care of the people around me? And so if you know the right thing to do, just do it. Because if you don't, well, that's sin. Uh, that, that's going against God's will. So hopefully we can all just sort of commit to doing the next right thing. Uh, Travis, you got anything to sum up uh, with it or will? If not, one of you guys want to lead us in a prayer to close out? Put a nice bow on it, Ben. <laughs> Travis, I'll you press want to, out. You, uh, do you want to lead the prayer? I'll do it. Go ahead, man. Your gracious, wonderful Father, we are so blessed to be able to know you, um, to be able to come to you uh, in this avenue of prayer. Lord, it's so much power, uh, but a lot of times I, I take it for granted that I can come before your throne anytime that I want. And God, I just want to thank you first and foremost for your word, your son who came and lived it out and taught us so well. And God, we just pray that as we study and we go through these studies, God, that we would truly bring out the message that you uh, wanted from them, uh, that we would get down to the meaning that they were to have and can have for us today. Lord, we pray that this Bible study would be a blessing to all those who see it uh, as it has been to us. God, I'm thankful for uh, Highland Park Church and, and all the work that they do for the kingdom. Uh, God, I pray just a blessing over them and their members. Uh, and their ministers and their elders and all their leadership, God, that they would continue to make decisions that would be pleasing in your sight, that you would just bless them this day. God, I'm thankful for the Riverside Church and uh, the leadership there and the school that they administer over in the homeschool program. And God, I just pray that you would keep all of them safe. And uh, Lord, just help us as we get ready and as we go from day to day, help us to take uh, the blows of this world uh, in stride, knowing that ultimately everything is in your hand, God. We, we don't pray for a return to normal. We pray for uh, a return to an even better situation uh, where your kingdom will flourish, God. We're so thankful for the simplicity of your kingdom that uh, we can worship and that we can assemble and that we can study and through this wonderful technology that you can still receive the glory and honor, Lord. There's so many people who on social media are just being uh, influenced for good, God. And we just pray that ultimately at the end of the day that you would receive the glory and honor. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.